Greetings, I am Herbert Erpaderp, and today I'm going to build a KV-2, because who doesn't like a good strong KV-2? As you can probably see on the box, this is the Tamiya 148th scale KV-2 gig and gigant giant. On the back of the box we see nothing. That's not a surprise at all, these kits never have anything on the back. But the front tells us all we need to know anyway. And what we need to know is KV-2. I guess some of the other information is kind of useful as well. Inside the box we find a stack of separately bagged green sprues. There are four sprues in total, including two which are identical with all the wheels and track parts on them. I'm not really surprised to see how neat and tidy the parts on these sprues are. Tamiya are quite consistent in their quality, at least in my observations. That is to say, they are consistently good. As always, there are mould lines, but they're very minor and shouldn't be much of an issue at all. You will spend a little bit of time cleaning them up, but that's fine and you kind of expect that from most kits anyway. The details are pretty good. This is a display kit after all, so you would expect it to be fairly well detailed. It's not as big as a 135th scale kit, so there might still be a little bit of simplification in parts, but not too much. And it's not like a KV-2 is exactly covered in intricate details anyway. There are some nice welding details moulded into the parts, which I quite like. I feel like this kit is going to go together nice and easily. The only area where I'm expecting there to be any issues is the tracks. They will almost definitely be a little bit fiddly, but the link and length tracks are preferable to rubber band tracks, at least in my opinion. This kit also includes a die-cast lower hull, which provides realistic weight and extra impact to small size scale model. That means extra impact when you throw it at someone, making this a more effective weapon. Looks pretty good if you ask me. I don't really feel the need for the extra weight, but it's not something I object to having. There's also an instruction leaflet. This has a bunch of information, the most important of which I suppose is the instructions themselves, which are presented as a series of exploded diagrams. Everybody likes explosions, right? These instructions are fairly easy to understand and follow. I did have a couple of moments of uncertainty, but I got past them pretty easily. There is also a simple guide for painting, but mostly decal application. You can, sort of, see those decals here. I would prefer to leave them in the bag for protection because it's going to be a while before I use them, but they do look good and there's a few choices for markings. Not a lot, but enough. There's also a bag with two screws in it. These will be used to join the plastic and metal hull parts to each other. You also get a set of poly caps, for capping polys, I guess. Or maybe for wheels and gun elevation. Whichever. And then there's this. I guess it's string, but I don't really know how to describe it. It's better than regular string and it doesn't go all frizzy. This is for making the towing cables. That's enough of that. Let's start gluing stuff together. Starting with the wheels. I began with the return rollers. These come as two parts and it's very simple to glue them together. There was a tiny bit of flash on the pins of some of these, but that's easily taken care of. We end up with a small pile of them. Very return rollery. Then we turn all of these into road wheels. Gotta have some road wheels or we can't go on the road. Or anywhere. These are also two parts and are very easily glued together. Unlike the return rollers though, these have keying, so the holes in the wheels will line up nice and neatly. The wheel pile grows. Next I join the idler wheels together. Again, these are two parts that go together very easily. And they are keyed as well, though in a different way to the road wheels. There's a little pin and matching hole on the inner parts of the spoky bits. That makes sense in my head. What matters is it goes together and looks good. Next comes the drive sprocket. A polycap goes in here like so. That's easy. The parts are keyed so it's also easy to put the two halves of the sprocket together. I applied pressure so that I could be sure there would be no inappropriate gaps. And then it's done and we've got ourselves a nice collection of wheels. Before installing the wheels I glue some stuff to the lower hull part. Like the axle for the drive sprockets. I had to trim these down a tiny bit and apply some pressure to get them into place, but they do go on. Obviously gluing plastic to metal means we need to use super glue here. 
I like the cheap kind you get from the supermarket with the applicator brush. It's cheaper than modelling specific superglue and it's almost certainly the exact same thing. Following those axles, I attach the lower front plate, which has a little bit of keying at the bottom to help with positioning. And then the rear lower hull part. This goes on very easily as well. Then the instructions tell us to install these towing shackly parts on the front of the hull, though for some reason not the rear. These go into place quite easily, though I found I had to give them a fair bit of nudging before they would sit in a way that I was satisfied with. I then installed this thing. I have no idea what this part is called, which I know is going to surprise all of you. I do know that it goes into place very easily, owing to that nice little recess for it. As you can see, there is one of these for each side. Now it's time to attach wheels. I start with the idler wheels which go on the front of the hull like so. There's not much to it, though I do try to make sure these are on as straight and neat as possible. That should lead to a better fit with the tracks. Next come the return rollers. These mount very easily to the raised cone shaped bits. If you press them all the way in, there should be no play in the fit and they should be nice and straight. And then I attach the road wheels, which go on just as easily as the rest of the wheels have. Not really surprising at all. Again, pressing the parts on all the way should result in little to no play in them, and therefore a nice straight set of wheels to join track parts to. Very easy, and like I said before, superglue is what you would use here. Plastic cement simply won't bond things to metal. I have to say that I'm pretty happy with how this looks so far. It's nice and neat. Also, the die-cast hull bottom gives this quite a bit of heft, so don't drop it on your face or something. I'm going to leave the drive sprockets off until track installation, because gluing them into place is bound to cause issues with the tracks later. I then glued the towing shackles onto the rear of the hull. I could have done this earlier too, I guess, but the instructions say now, and I didn't really feel that rebellious. Then come the tracks. The top part of the tracks is a big single piece, which makes it very easy to get that sag in the tracks that KV tanks usually have. There isn't any keying to get it into the right spot, but you can pretty well eyeball it with the shape of the tracks. Then we add the curved end sections, which are made up of two track link segments. This isn't too hard, just a little bit fiddly. As you can see, I've installed the drive sprocket and made sure the teeth link into the tracks. Then the lower track parts go on. At first, the fit wasn't perfect. The run of tracks was a bit too long, but not so long that removing one of the single link parts fixed it. It's like they were half a link too long. I did a bunch of fiddling and eventually got the tracks to sit how I wanted them. They do look good for the most part, but I felt like they didn't quite sit perfectly in some spots. I suppose we can always just claim this is good strong Soviet construction. Before putting the tracks on the right side, I installed this curved platey thing. This isn't too hard to install at all, though there does seem to be a bit of a gap at the top. I don't think that's going to be visible though once we put the whole top on, so I don't worry about it. I did, obviously, install the tracks on the right side, but it didn't really seem worth showing because it's pretty much exactly the same as on the left side. Then I did some drilling. We need to make a few holes here to mount things like the stowage bins, saw, and other bits. It's not hard to drill them out of course, but do pay attention to the instructions here. I can see how some of the drilling points might be missed. Also, these holes do need to be drilled out before the hull top is attached to the lower part, unless for some reason you would prefer to drill without the benefit of guide holes. Personally, I quite like the guide holes. Before actually joining the hull parts together, the instructions want us to add more details. So why not? I start with these brackety things that go down the sides of the hull like so. It's very easy to get these into place. They mount right into a slot. You will have to nudge them a bit until they're as vertical as you can get them, but that's not too difficult at all. Installation is simple, but I think they look quite good. I'm sure I said that about a lot of the parts of this kit during the build stream. I then attached the antenna mount to the front of the hull here. If you wanted, you could easily make your own antenna from some fine wire or maybe some stretched out sprue. No antenna is included with the kit. Then comes the driver's vision device. The little slot should be on the lower side of this. This is followed by another more periscopy vision device, I believe, 
which is just as easy to install as the previous part. Next, I installed the brackety things that go at the front of the hull here. These were slightly more fiddly than the other brackets down the side of the hull, but only slightly. Now seemed like as good a time as any to screw the hull parts together. Heh, <laughs> screw. I wasn't prepared and didn't have a screwdriver of exactly the right size, but I did get it done. At least the screw at the rear. The forward one was another matter. I couldn't even get it to sit straight in its hole. I didn't find this to be a big problem though because the plastic parts contact each other at the front and rear, so I glued those together using plastic cement, making sure that all the parts were lined up properly. It went together pretty well really, though I am pleased that the very slight gap at the front will be covered over later. I apply some pressure just to make sure all the parts will stay together nicely. Then so that nobody sees the front screw and how I messed it up, I add this, what I assume is an escape hatch. It kind of looks like a button. Boop. Moving on, it's time for more details. I glue together this headlamp and then set it aside to bond while I assemble the whole machine gun. This is a simple matter of slotting the gun in through the back of the mounting and then sliding the outer cap bit, whatever it's called, over the gun's barrel. The parts are small and a bit fiddly because of that, but it's not too hard to do. Then I figured why not glue it into place right away. I make sure the gun is at the elevation I want it at, and then I attach the headlamp. This goes into the inner of the two mounting recesses on the front of the hull. A little nudging and it's in place. Very simple. Very lamp. Next comes this angled front part. Not sure what this is called, maybe it's just to hide gaps in the front of the real KV hull. This has keying without which I would probably never have figured out which way around it should go. Thanks to that it goes into place nice and easily. I then add the horn. You never know when you'll need to honk. This is quite fiddly and I found I needed to use tweezers. I did this carefully because holding rounded parts like this in tweezers is a sure way to send the part flying if you squeeze too hard. Then I put this ring part for the driver's hatch in place. You can see I initially didn't get it quite right. Moving it did cause a slight mess, but nothing too bad really. Next comes this strange looking hooky thing. This seems to be something that holds the towing cables in place, and it mounts into the hole we drilled into the side of the hull below the turret ring. Tweezers helped a lot here. I also added glue to the contact point with the bracket just to give it a little bit of extra strength. There's one of these on either side of the tank. I then install the driver's hatch. I like that this has detailing on the inside for if you want to model it open. I don't, so I just glue it right into the hole. Very simple. That big hole at the rear of the tank isn't a cargo bay. This isn't a tank ute, so I cover it up with the engine deck part. That makes a lot of sense, right? This looks easy to place, and that's because it was. I really like the bolt detailing on that part. I installed the exhaust pipes next. These have D-shaped keying, and during the stream I said something like this would stop you putting them on wrong, but really it won't. You could still quite easily put them on backwards, but that would just be plain silly, so maybe don't do that. They are easy to install and I think they look quite good. The ends are open so it'll look like there's some depth there when this is painted, because there actually is depth, obviously. The engine deck hatches can then be installed. These are just as easy as the driver's hatch. In fact, they're pretty much identical. They also have detail on the inside. Personally, I don't feel like it's worth modelling these open because there's nothing inside the hull. There's nothing to stop you from adding your own internal detail though if you really want that. Then I attach the saw to the left track guard thing. This should aid the tank's crew quite a lot. As you can see, the model doesn't come with the traditional Soviet log, so they're going to have to cut their own. Then we install this stowage bin. This is very easy to install. There's a couple of pins that go into the mounting hole, and it more or less just drops right into place. On the other side I add this thing. I think it might be a gun cleaning kit, though I'm not sure. Then, as you can see, I've added the other two stowage bins on the right. The instructions also say to make the towing cables and install them at this time, but I've left them off because I'm not sure if I want to include them at all, and also because they'll be much easier to paint separately. And then I forgot about assembling them. Anyway, 
Now is the time for turret. I start by gluing together the main gun. There are pins and corresponding sockets to help with this, though there is still a fair bit of play in it, so you are able to nudge it just so to get the best fit you can. It looks pretty good, though you might want to do further cleanup to make it look even better. Then I assemble this big boxy mantletty bit. This is made up of a few parts, and I did make a bit of a mess with some glue, but it's not too bad, and the roughness probably helps make it look more Soviet. There's a bunch of keying so everything goes together neatly and easily. And then it can be glued into the curved mantlet part. The shape of this makes sure that you can only put it together one way, unless you're really really dedicated I suppose. You probably aren't. In the rear of the mantlet assembly I glue this part. As best I can tell the only purpose of this is to add these bolty protrusions to the bottom of the mantlet. It seems a bit odd and it's kind of fiddly, but I got there in the end. Then there's this gun elevation doodad. This is where the other two polycaps go. I'm pretty sure I'm putting it together wrong in the first couple of clips, because it looked strange when I was test fitting so I pulled it apart and revised. This is one of the benefits of test fitting. In this shot we can see it correctly assembled. Probably. Consult the instructions if you're a bit confused by this, that's what they're there for. I then sandwich the turret front part between that assembly and the mantlet part. Once I was satisfied with how it went together I added glue. Obviously if you want your gun to elevate and depress you'll need to be a bit more careful with your glue than I am. I want it to stay solidly in place so I'm just putting the glue everywhere. It goes together pretty well though the curved parts don't look like they're sitting quite right but Soviet construction, right? Then I glue the gun into place. This is very simple. There's no keying, but there doesn't need to be. The gun is more or less just a simple cylinder with no muzzle brake requiring proper orientation. I leave that assembly to sit for a bit and I work on the roof. The commander's hatch goes into place super easy, just like the other three hatches did. Then these conical bits go on. I guess these are periscopes or maybe some kind of rangefinder. They're something and they're something that goes into place pretty easily, though they're not keyed so you can put them on with the opening facing any way you like. I put them facing forward because that's how it appears in the instructions, and I've no idea if they can swivel about. I then install the machine gun on the turret rear. This is similar to the hull MG, just this time instead of a mounting we're slotting the gun in through the turret wall and then gluing the outer cap thing on. Nothing too tricky really, though the parts are small which as I'm sure I said before makes things a little bit more tricky, but only a little bit. Then I glue the rear door on. There's some big hinge details here that also act as keying for the door, making this very easy to put on. That's one heck of a solid looking door. Then I glue the right side of the turret to the bottom part. This is quite easy. There are guide parts that make sure everything more or less slots into place, though you'll have to be careful not to nudge those parts out of place again. It is easy to do. Then I add the rear wall and some extra glue between it and the right side, and then unsurprisingly comes the left wall part. Very easy. I would suggest doing this relatively quickly though, especially the first two parts, just so that you've got some adjustment time in case things don't go together properly right away. It'll probably be fine though. Gluing the turret front assembly on is just as easy, though unlike the other parts I found I had to nudge this around a bit until it looked like it was on properly. The roof is next, and it's not going to surprise you when I say that it was very easy to put on, so I just won't say it. Wait, shit. Anyway, there's still some small details to add, so let's add some vision devices. The one that faces the rear is a different part to the others, so be aware of that when clipping out the parts, though it won't fit onto the mounting holes for the other ones anyway. It's very easy to place, and the others are too. Now the KV-2's crew can see if there's anything approaching. How convenient. Then six of these grab railings can go on. These are pretty thin, so I was a bit worried about breaking them when removing them from the sprues and cleaning them up, but it was all for nothing because none of them broke, which is always satisfying. These do look pretty decent, though also a bit messy where I've spilled a bit of glue. That's okay, it could probably be passed off as being dirty. 
I would imagine these would collect some dirt during use. Either way, they look fine. Then the turret can join the hull through the use of these locking tabs. And the 148th scale KV-2 by Tamiya is now completed. And if you ask me, it looks glorious and mighty. I think the KV-2 is really cool and an interesting looking tank, and this model does it a lot of justice. I think it looks great. Not that I'm surprised with that. I have built a couple of the other Tamiya kits in this scale and so far they've all impressed me. Quite a lot actually. I will probably do the Pershing next, and I'm sure it's going to be just as good as this. In my opinion, the model is quite well detailed. I mean, the KV-2 does have a fair amount of plain, solid, mostly flat bits, and it isn't really covered in tiny little details or anything fancy like that, but I'm pretty sure most of what should be there is there. And there are some nice weld details, and it's pretty nice that the hatches have detailing on the inside, even though I modelled them closed anyway and there's no interior detail. That's fine by me. The kit would probably be quite a bit more expensive if there were internal detail. Everything is nice, crisp and neat, and it didn't require a lot of cleanup, which is always nice. Most of the parts went together exactly as they should have with no fuss or extra work. As I mentioned earlier, there should be some towing cables, but those can always be removed from tanks and lost, so I don't think it's too bad to leave them off, but I will decide whether I want to add them before I paint this tank. I'm actually quite excited to start painting this pretty soon. Not right away, so don't start bugging me about it. In fact, don't bug me about it ever. I do have some other things to finish first, but this KV-2 is pretty high on the painting priority list. The build was relatively easy and straightforward. I would say the most challenging part of it was the tracks, though while they were fiddly, they weren't the hardest thing in the world to do. Mostly they are just time consuming, really. As with pretty much all of the models you've seen on my channel lately, I built this KV-2 on stream, and it took me two sessions to get it done. Of course, you've got to bear in mind that I'm a pretty slow builder and easily distracted, along with doing things like filming and interacting with chat, so this is likely a nice afternoon project for the average modeler. Speaking of streams, if you would like to see me build stuff on stream and chat about what I'm doing and such, and also get a bit of a preview of what's coming up in my videos, head on over to my Twitch channel for which there's a link in the description. Give me a follow and you'll be notified when I go live. It'll be good times. Anyway, I think this tank is pretty great. What do you think? Is it a good strong derp tank? Have you built this kit yourself? If you have, we would love to see pictures of it over on my Discord server. There's a link for that below too. Either way, tell me what you think in the comment section below. If you found this video entertaining or helpful in some way, it would be amazing if you shared it with your friends or somebody else who might find it useful. And if you haven't already, why not subscribe, follow, ring the bell, and all the other things you do on YouTube and social media. Links to all the things including my Patreon and Twitch channel are in the description below. You can also find the YouTube members join button too. And as always, I shall return soon, so until then, be excellent to each other and thanks for watching. Farewell.